Okay, um, today I want to uh, uh, finish talking about book three and specifically the discussion about the education of in gymnastic, the education of the guardians with gymnastic, care of the you know physical training, that kind of stuff, care of the body. Um, and uh, but I want to take it. I want to take our study actually into book four uh, because it's in book four that this discussion that was launched with Adamantus in book two. Where they're talking about the proper educations for the education for the guardians, that it, it comes to an end in book four. It comes to an end at four twenty seven C. So I want to get that far. Um, and a, as with the first half of book three, I'm not going to be talking about it in in great detail. There is a lot of detail, uh, but I want to just highlight a few points and just draw your attention to some things. Um, uh, the themes in this section I find really interesting, really, really, really uh, remarkably rich. And so I, I actually, you know, obviously I encourage you to read everything, but I really encourage you to read the second half of um, book three. Uh, there, there's a lot of very insightful and very provocative stuff in it. Um, but so let's um, talk about it a, a, a little bit. Um, I want to start, uh, draw your attention first to 403D. He says, Socrates says, it doesn't look to me as though it's a sound body that's by its virtue makes the soul good, but the opposite. A good soul by its own virtue makes the body as good as it can be. That's that's an interesting idea. So um, I'd just like you to hold on to that idea, that it's the, the good soul is what makes the body good. Um, the relationship of body and soul is itself then a pretty central issue here that I'd like to have on your mind. Now, what do we mean by body and soul? Um, I mean, I think by both of those, we mean very everyday realities, things that anybody can recognize. So by soul, we basically mean who you are, uh, where who means, you know, all those powers that you as a person, as an agent, as a subject as someone with points of view, someone with a perspective, right? All, all those powers that you, in that sense, have. So you have desires, um, you, you have feelings, uh, you have ideas, you have memories. You know, that that's when we're talking about that, th those are all things that, that are about who, that in the sense of who you are as a person. Uh, those things will all be gone when you die. When we talk about the body, we don't just mean the thing that will still be there when you die, and I'll explain why in a moment. But but that's not a bad place to look at. Look, right? Uh, by the body, we do mean the uh, this natural organism. But the reason I'm, I say it's not the thing when you die, I mean a living organism. So I, there, when we talk about the body, we mean the fact that you have hands and elbows and eyes. And so th these are the very specific, materially specific ways in which you exist as a thing in the world, right? Um, and th those things, th that, that your, your organism, uh, obviously in s all kinds of significant ways, defines uh, how you can function and so on. But, but what it is to talk about your organism is quite different from what it is to talk about your ideas, right? Because your 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 body, um, you know, is well, let's say six feet tall, but your your desire is not six feet tall. Um, your memories are not six feet tall, right? They're, they're very different kinds of realities that we're talking about. So when we're talking about your soul, the thing he's talking about there is what, whatever it is that um, constitutes your perspective um, and all, all of the uh, dimensions that pertain to that, um, uh, and then and then there's a real question to ask. You know, both of those things are manifestly real. You are someone, and you got these hands, right? And and it's it is a straightforward question. What's the relationship between those two things? Um, we don't actually particularly need to worry about answering that right now. It's inter It's an interesting question. Uh, and there's lots to say about answering it, and there's lots to say in the Platonic writings about answering it. Brilliant things, um, but that's not uh, that's not so much what we need to focus on now. We need just to focus on the the, the 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 fact of those realities of who you are that that those words are basically referring to. Um, and 
so the, the reason I, I picked out this line about it's not the good body that makes the good soul, but the good soul that makes the good body. The reason I po- focused on that is because it names a relationship between them and is particularly relevant to gymnastic. And so one of the very first things that Socrates says is that um, this is, this is uh, around 410C, uh, roughly. He's, he says, you know, contrary to that thing he said in book two, where he, you know, just trotted out the familiar thing, you know, gymnastic for the body, music for the soul. What he says here, as I already mentioned when we read that passage, he says here um, at 410, right before C, did those who established an, an education in music and gymnastic do so for other reasons than the one supposed by some, namely that the latter should care for the body and the former for the soul? And, and um, Glaucon says, well, for what? And Socrates says, it's likely that they established both chiefly for the soul. Um, so as I said, I wanted to bring up this issue, um, but but uh, the the thing I wanted you to think about is the question. By 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 thematizing the issue of body and soul, I wanted you to think about what it is that you're actually doing when you um, fiddle around with your hands. Um, commonly, people draw a kind of distinction between the body and the soul that's quite different than the one that Socrates is is going to emphasize. And really what he wants to emphasize is that the things that you do that you might commonly think of as bodily or just bodily, they're fundamentally matters of soul. They're fundamentally matters of ways you're grappling with who you are. Um, You'll see that later, I think, when we talk about sex. People often talk about that as a bodily desire or something like that. Socrates, um, I think, portrays that as kind of a ridiculous way to talk. But uh, here, think think about think about exercising. When you go to the gym and you're you're running on the r- treadmill or you're lifting weights or whatever it is that you do, uh, you, you know, when you train, you know, you might think you I'm building my body. Well, the question that he's really going to ask is. What are you doing psychologically when you do that? What's it doing to you psychologically? I guess I could have said that before. The soul just means what's psychological. They're exactly the same word. The English word psychology just uses the Greek word psyche, psyche logic, right? The logic of the psyche, the logic of the soul. That's all it means. So, we, so the issue is, so, so, the, so the question is this: When you are training, is that a physiological matter or a psychological matter? And the thing is, he's he's interested in focusing on how it's a psychological matter, and that's the point I, I just made when I read that line of four ten B or whatever it was. Um, and that's that's actually one of the big things I'd like you to try to lodge in your head. Oh, that these are ways of grappling with the soul, um, and that's why they're part of education. Right? Uh, so yes, you know. Um, just like a healthy diet, you know, getting kids in elementary school to run around is a way of making sure their muscles develop properly and so on. There, there's physiological matters there. There is something that needs to be cared for on physiological terms, and exercise is part of that. Uh, but there's a lot more than that that goes on in exercise. And that attending to physiological needs is, re- is actually relatively minor. And I say exercise. Gymnastic is bigger than exercise. Really what it, what what it means is all the ways you sort of deal with and care for your body. And a lot of the ways you care for the body are uh, have a fundamental psychological significance. Anyway, so but let's carry on with that. So I want to start with that point just to get you thinking about that and to get you to realize that the, the easy ways you distinguish what has to do with your body and what has to do with your soul or your mind or whatever you call it um, don't work so well. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the thing, uh, um, the first thing I want to just draw your attention to is the discussion they have from 405A to 409A. And they talk about medicine. You might recall that when Socrates and Glaucon spoke in book two about the city nowadays, uh, Socrates said, oh, you're going to need a lot more doctors, you know. Why? Well, because you're going to get all these, you know, people are going to start eating a lot of sugar or whatever. You know, they're going to eat... Uh, they're going to eat a lot of cakes and all those other things that I talked about there. And so, you know, people are going to get sick. Why? Because they're going to have a kind of unhealthy diet, right? So um, that that unhealthy diet, well, that, that's a kind of an interesting thing, too. It's, it's unhealthy maybe for more reasons than one. Um, obviously, the primary sense of unhealthy is kind of physiological in the sense that 
if if your diet is an awful lot of sugar and very little uh, protein or whatever the other things are, you know, you, you know your your body your organism is just not going to function that well, and uh, uh, it's it's not going to get sort of what it needs by nature. So going back to the the language from Book One of the Republic of, about justice, you're not giving the body what it's due, right? Um, and so so yes. Uh, that's something, but then, but but there are also psychological matters there too, right? Why why do people want to eat desserts all the time? Uh, uh, there, and there could be good or bad reasons for that. Like, it could be a sign of irresponsibility. Like, you just you're just not being realistic about the needs of your life, you know. And so so it, it's that. It could be a reflection of a just an overwhelming focus on entertainment. You know, you, like you just can't deal with anything. It's just like watching TV, like. All you can do is find something that's immediately pleasing to you because you can't can't hold your attention longer than that or something like that, right? Those would be some of the negative ones. But the positive ones are, well, you might you know, you might not always just want to eat out of necessity. You might uh, you might like to have some pleasure sometime, and that's a thing you can do that lots of other animals couldn't really do. Like you can think, oh, I do this thing for pleasure. I mean, you could think about sex that way, you know, in the in the in the world of nature sort of broadly speaking, sex f- exists for reproduction. And by exists for what I mean is, like, that's just the role it plays in the natural world. So if you ignore people, basically the story of sex and the story of reproduction are the same story. With people, it's entirely different, right? With people, sex is primarily about, um, I guess I wouldn't automatically just say pleasure. That's a big part of it, but it's all, it's not just that. You know, there's a lot more involved in people's sexual relationships than just the pursuit of pleasure. It's, it's got a lot to do with relationships. It's got a lot to do with how you're interacting with that other person. And that's, and that's you know, great and important. But the point I want to make is that whole world, you know, from pleasure through, through the whole story of intimacy and interaction with another and whatever else goes on in your sexual affairs, um, those are matters those are all matters of psychology and not, and, you know, they're separated from reproduction. Like people make a point of doing things to make sure uh, reproduction isn't going to happen, right? Um, so um, the separation of pleasure from natural function is, isn't just evidence of being irresponsible or making a mistake or only needing entertainment. It can also be you know, one of the richest and most valuable things about us, right? And, and you, indeed, um, you know, you can you can say, well, we, you know, we make fine desserts and so on, or you just want sugar. Yeah, but you can, it's also that people can appreciate fine food, you know, so, so you can, in a way, find reasons for criticizing an excessive focus on refinement and fine dining. Like, if that's all your life is about, you might think there, there are, some limitations there. But on the other hand, to have it be the case that people have over centuries come to come to refine the way they cook and have developed these amazing meals and amazing amazing foods, like that's that's more like uh that's almost like art, right? It's an appreciation of things that are beautiful. And you know, going back to the things they were saying about music and grace. You know, it's an, it's, a, it's an appreciation of getting things that really fit and producing this amazing experience. It happens to be, you know, an experience of taste that goes away quickly and whatever else. But but the, the sensibility that goes into that is very much that kind of musical sensibility they were talking about. And so so I just trying to I'm trying to bring out sort of the ambivalence of that point then. Right. That that we. Uh, we can separate things from their natural function. Sometimes that's a mark of really responsibility. Sometimes it's a mark of, of um, great advancements, the distinctively interesting and important things about humanity. So going back then to this issue, we're talking about medicine. Um, and I said, well, you, sorry, you said you're going to need more medicine because people are going to be getting sick. Yes. And, and that's, uh, part, that's, uh, that is already reflecting the fact that people are um, eating these different foods. And, and as I said, there you can already see that that issue of focusing on desserts or focusing on refined food or whatever surely has a physiological significance, which is why you need doctors. But it's also a psychological matter, a matter of the soul, right? It has to do with the values and the goals of the people involved, right? You can't, you can't correctly, you can't adequately interpret 
what's going on with people who eat a lot of desserts if all you can talk about are the terms of physiology. So that there, that was that already. That was that was I was trying to get at the level of desserts, bringing out this thing that you know matters of the body are already matters of the soul. But anyways, but then he says about medicine here. But you are going to get people who are going to be sick all the time, and so you're going to need a whole bunch more doctors. And then they give a, a quite an interesting account of medicine, which I urge you to read in, in carefully. Um, but uh, the, there's a point that's made there that I think is quite profound. And they're going to make an exactly parallel point about law and judges in a moment, too. Let me make the point about medicine first. And, he, and basically, he says, um, if, uh, how can I, I want to put this the right way. I want, I want to put it the right way. But the simplest way to put it is this. Medicine is really for the healthy, not for the sick. Now, in the face of that, that sounds paradoxical and ridiculous, but with a little bit of thought, it actually turns out to be quite insightful. So he says, you know, what medicine, what medicine really should be is a way of addressing the problems that come to people in the context of an otherwise healthy life when they're struck down by disease or whatever else, right? And that's like, you know, that's kind of the way veterinary medicine works. It's, it, it, it um, attends to the illnesses that come upon, you know, horses or in, in the modern world, dogs. You know, initially, that wasn't part of veterinary work at all. But, uh, but it tends to the problems that come to horses and dogs be, because where even in the context of their normal healthy living, they're, they're afflicted by the things that naturally happen to them and the medicine's going to come in there to try to help them. That's very different from medicine as a skill devoted to helping people with the problems that have come about because of their unhealthy living. If you're just living badly all the time, you know, you just take a lot of drugs and you um, eat a lot of crappy food and you don't get enough sleep and uh, you're basically just poisoning your body all the time and never taking care of it, um, you're going to be in bad shape. But that's not... Um, a sort of a natural affliction coming upon you. That's you failing to do what you should be doing. And medicine is there to try to help you correct some of those mistakes. So in a way, medicine there is devoted to dealing with something unnatural or, or dealing with a phenomenon of culture, not dealing so much with a phenomenon of nature. So anyway, re read that through and see if you get that point that um, there's a real difference between understanding medicine as a corrective you bring in to you know mop up the mess from your crappy living to try to to try to keep allowing you to live in a poor way versus medicine is a thing that in a basic way you don't need uh, in and of yourself but that is there when a problem naturally develops the issues that medicine has to deal with are quite different in that case. So think about that. And, and, and so medicine in, you know, the feverish city is different than medicine in the, what Socrates called the, the true city or, you know, the, the first city w would be. Um, and he makes a similar point about law. You know, law makes sense if it's, you know, a set of insights for helping good, responsible deal, people deal with the real problems that can come up between people. But that's very different from law as a set of rules you can use to figure out how you can take someone to court and sue them for something so that you can get rich because they, they, you know, slipped up and you can nail them now, right? So people can use the law courts for those sort of manipulative purposes. But and Socrates is saying, like, that's not what law is for. That's, that is, that's kind of a perversion of law. Now, um, when you call something a perversion, um, that means it, it's sort of varied from its natural path. Now, obviously, in a way, you can't quite, you can't ever really call something a perversion of law, strictly speaking, because law is itself not a natural phenomenon. It's precisely a phenomenon of culture to begin with. The, the, the laws don't grow on trees. So if, if a cultural phenomenon in that sense um, becomes, so to speak, perverted, um, it, it's not so obvious it's a perversion, right? In other words, you might say, well, maybe that means that phenomenon in itself 
has a kind of problem in it, like the problem of the guardians. Right? You might think, oh, the guardians who turn on the city have perverted the role of guardian. Yes, or maybe in the very way that role of guardian was defined, that result was kind of guaranteed right off the bat. So it's not so much a perversion as a revelation of the kind of intrinsic problem in that thing. And that could also be the case with medicine and with law, that these things, like on the one hand, we can, we can make sense of that distinction because between medicine as you would sort of like to see it functioning versus medicine as it actually functions, or law as you think, yeah, that's where it would really be what we want it to be versus law how it actually functions. Um, so it might mean a perversion, or it might mean what you're seeing is a kind of problem or attention that's built into the very meaning of those realities in the first place. And that would be the thing to think about. Anyway, I, I, I strongly recommend that you read carefully these sections on medicine and, and the law courts and, and law judges, you know, what, what, a, what a proper judge is, like a proper doctor versus what a, the wrong kind of judge is and the wrong kind of doctor. Um, and it's related to, right, the phenomena of the city nowadays. And think about that distinction and its and its significance. It's very rich. Um, and then he goes on to say a little bit more too. Um, and and another question there is, what does it take to have? Um, and this is this is a uh, right around the end. I think this is four hundred eight D to four hundred nine A roughly. Yeah, um, they're they're saying, um, you know, what's it going to take for you to to be able to um, understand and respond to these cases well, right? The cases of illness in the context of the doctor or cases of crime in the context of the judge. And he makes an interesting claim there. He says, doctors are going to be better at doctoring if they have had the sicknesses, presumably because they, they then know what they're seeing and they know what it is. Um, uh, but he says judges aren't, so in that case, it's better to know the bad thing to be able to know how to make it good. But he says, that's not the case with judges. You don't want judges to have actually engaged in all those criminal acts in their life um, and, and think, oh, now they're going to be better at judging them because they, they know them. So he says, you know, for the, for the point of view of doctors, it's better for them to have had experience of the illness illnesses. From the point of view of judges, it's better for them to have only theoretical knowledge of the crimes. Again, I, I think that's an interesting point in a couple of ways. It's an interesting point f first because it says, like, you really need to know the those things that could go wrong, you kind of, kind of got to know them on their own terms to be able to judge them well. I think that's a powerful point. And and then I think the powerful point that's added to that is that that really means, you know, in a way, you, um, it's by experiencing them you, that you'd know them. That would be an interesting point. And then the third interesting point is, oh, but maybe there's a difference in how those things work with judges and uh, doctors, right? Maybe you wouldn't want them to experience it here. You would want them to experience it there. A set of interesting points, each one, quite worthy of consideration in its own right. The thing I'd like to ask, the thing I'd like to pose to you is a, is a thought, you know, might it be that they have that backwards? Might it be that, in fact, it's not so important for the doctor to have been sick and that theoretical knowledge of the, you know, virtually infinite range of sicknesses is both more desirable and probably fine. Um, Whereas I wonder if for the judge, the opposite is the case, that there's something really troubling about a judge who doesn't have some sense of an experiential connection with the one who's being judged as a criminal. Um, you, uh, you might disagree. I, I'm just, I just want to pr propose this to you as a thought. You know, like we, So, for example, we often talk in... Um, context of talking about law in the contemporary world. Uh, we talk about a jury of one's peers and so on. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we ever get those, and, I, and I'm not sure that the reasoning behind that still has much significance in people's minds, but we talk about that anyway. You should be judged by your peers. But So think about that idea. You know, Are, are you, if, if you're, let's say, in America, you know, which has a real historical problem with um, the you know, enslavement of uh, black Africans, and then the centuries of, of um, cultivating this kind of uh, uh, oppressed black underclass. If you think of the realities 
of living in that situation. You think of the, uh, you could ask this, is the black man in his late teens, early 20s, who uh, has been from, let's say, you know, from Los Angeles, who's been somehow involved in a gang, Bloods, and uh, um, has uh, been involved in selling some kind of drugs and has been caught with firearms and so on. And that person is, is involved in some kind of, I don't know, domestic violence or something like that. Uh, is is that person in the courtroom when being tried by a very rich white man um, who, as they say here, has never had any experience of those things? Is Does that seem like fitting judgment? And, and maybe maybe you think it does. But my, my first reaction is to think there's some, there's a problem there that the judgment is coming down from a very alien perspective, from one that has no, no real meaningful sense of what the world of this person is and what it means for the person to have engaged in those activities. And so this person is being judged by someone who in a really significant way doesn't even understand what's going on. That's, that's my own thought about that. Um, like I said, you're free to disagree with it. Um, and it's manifestly the opposite of what they say here. So you might think, well, Plato doesn't think that. But um, anyway, that's the, th that's the thing that I'm led to think about when I read this through. I'm led to, th you know, as they raise these issues here and they talk about what you want from these people, my, my thinking on these issues comes to quite a different conclusion than the one that, that Glaucon ends up agreeing to, namely that uh, the, the, the one I think would be that you actually might want a judge who has a more of a living connection with the kind of realities, the kind of lives of the people he or she or they is putatively judging. Uh, rather than being someone who only reflects on these theoretically. Whereas with the doctor, I might think the opposite. I might think, um, yeah, I mean, of course, if you have been sick, you kind of know what it's like and you can sympathize with the patient's suffering. But who cares? I mean, it's, oh, it's an overstatement to say who cares. And of course, people want their doctors to be sympathetic and so on. But that's not really what you want the doctor to do. You want the doctor to know how to fix that problem. And that comes, from, I think, a lot more from knowing... Um, how the streptococcus bacillus acts, which you learn from a text textbook, than knowing, you know, what it feels like to you be for, for you to be sick today. Um, and so I'm inclined to think that the, that the, that the, those, those things are inverted there. But that'd be an interesting thing for you to think about. What what why? Let me add one more thing about why I think that might be interesting. You see here, um, they're sort of portraying it as you know, if you're sick or healthy in the case of the doctor issue, like that's kind of morally neutral. Which is a little bit funny, since they've just been saying that there's something kind of morally wrong with people who who live an unhealthy lifestyle. Um, so that also, you, you might have mixed views about that. But my point is that's kind of what they've been saying. So it's sort of funny to say that it would be fine for the doctor to have experienced all those illnesses. Uh, whereas on the other hand, they're they're acting as if it's there's something you know really morally repugnant about criminals, and it's better for the judge to be pure. Um, and that it seems to me. Uh, well, that, that reflects a particular understanding of crime that, that is not exactly the one I share. And maybe even, and I, and, I, and I think my reason for not sharing it has to do with things I learned from Socrates when he said back in uh, the Apology that no one does the wrong, no one does bad willingly. Right? I think, you know, there's, there's a desire to polarize good behavior and bad behavior and to say they're entirely different kinds of things. Whereas the point Socrates made in his response to Miletus was that, in a way, everybody's trying to do good. They have very different views of what that is. They have very different ways of understanding the situation. But but uh, in a way, if you can see things from within the perspective of that person, you kind of see why it makes sense for them to do those things. And that doesn't mean there's no reason for calling some people bad or whatever else. But it does mean you don't want to see crime as coming from a particular source, namely the bad people the bad motivations, whatever, and, and nice things coming from something else. Like you, you need to see both of those as reflections of kind of the way human beings make sense of their situations. So 
um, so that's a further reason why I think there's an issue there. And then that goes back to the way this whole conversation with Adamantus began, when they said, oh, okay, the good is only going to cause the good things and not cause the bad things. That's been their premise throughout this whole study. But as I said when we first introduced that, Socrates himself makes explicit that his view is the opposite of that. So I, I kind of think that this point when we get to the judge might be a place where you can start to see that issue, having a little bit of bite. Anyway, uh, that's the first thing in the study of gymnastics. So why is that in gymnastics? Well, the stuff about the court, I guess, is not so much, but the stuff about medicine is. Like, it's coming out of a discussion about how we handle our bodies, right? Um, uh, let me move on. They, they then talk about this, and they say, okay, what are we going to do with um, the the training of the of the guardians and so on? So, so uh, and you know, they've been saying, like, you should try to be healthy and so on, and so now they're going to try to prescribe, you know, the healthy bodily physical life of the guardians. Um, and that's where he says at 410b, this thing I said, won't the musical man hunt for a gymnastic by following these same tracks, the simple, simple, healthy ones, um, so that he won't require any art of medicine. Like they've been saying, you know, live in a way that medicine isn't actually something you need. Um, and then, and then uh, Glaucon says, yes, that's my opinion. And Socrates says, okay, so moreover, he'll undergo these very exercises and labors looking less to strength than to the spirited part of his nature and for the purpose of arousing it. Unlike those other contestants who te treat diets and labors as means to force. Yeah, so you can see, you know, people, some people do exercise and do things because they want to get strong and whatever else. And he's saying here, the healthy way to approach exercise and so on is because you're trying to deal with the spirited part of your nature. And that's the thing he goes on to talk about, and which I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to keep brief, but again, I think this is a really powerful and important point. Um, that's when he said, so d don't, didn't you see, don't you see, Glaucon, that the real reason people have established gymnastics is for the soul, not for the body, the thing I started with. And then he says, um, so then Socrates says at, at 410c, don't you notice, I said, the turn of mind of those who maintain a lifelong familiarity with gymnastic but don't touch music, or again, those who do the opposite, those people who just focus on music and don't attend to gymnastic. And, and, and Glaucon says, oh, what, what are you talking about? And Socrates says, well, on the one hand, like the people who just do gymnastic and don't attend to music, he says, they become savage and hard. And on the other hand, the people who just do music without gymnastic, they become soft and tame. And then Glaucon basically agrees with that. And as he's particularly says, those who make use of unmixed gymnastic turn out more savage than they ought. And I think that's a powerful point. You know, um, I, I guess I think about what, what I've what what I've seen. It's a world I don't know about, so I would be a bad example of a judge. But just you know, from what I see on TV and so on, it doesn't look like professional soccer players are very nice people. Uh, they're in great shape, boy. It's they're you know, if you wanted an image of how you could, you know, perfect and refine, particularly a man's body. Um, those, you know, those guys are remarkable. For the, they're, they're agile, they're perfectly fit, they're strong, they're fast, it's, it's lightning reflexes, all that kind of stuff. But, but um, they, the impression one gets is that they don't have well-developed moral lives. They're egocentric, mean, uh, greedy, dishonest. Like, I don't know if that's true of any person. So these, these are, in a way, slanders. All I'm saying is, this is how I've seen those people presented. I, I don't have any real reason to disbelieve it. I don't know whether it's true or not. But even if it's not true, I think that you can see that the image I've just projected on those players is a reality that you will have recognized, certainly in some people who, uh, you know, orient their lives around aggressive competition get very strong but they don't they don't really develop those other things right um, and so they become savage right they're oriented around the use of force for winning right? and then on the other hand well actually so let, before before we get to the other hand let me let me read what Socrates says there Socrates said surely the savage stems from that spirited part of their nature we talked about that before the thumos that came up when they're initially talking about the guardians, and that's that thing in you that doesn't want to lose, right? Yeah, and so there's certain ways you can do your gymnastic not to tame that thing, but to cultivate it. I'm not going to lose, and I'm going to get so good at winning that I'm just going to win, 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 right? There, you've taken the most savage part of your soul and um, pumped it up, right? Um, 
So he says the savage stems from the spirited part of the nature, which, if rightly trained, would be courageous, right? That's actually what they said at the time. Like, yeah, there's something important about that part of you that's willing to risk death even for the sake of of doing something. And that Socrates made a big part of that. Socrates' speech after he talked with Miletus was all about how what matters in your life is what you're prepared to die for, right? What you're prepared to take a stand on. That's courage, right? So where you're prepared to say, I am not going to lose this. But, you know, it's very different to say I'm not going to, what I'm not going to lose on is my stand about what's morally right versus saying what I'm prepared to die for is to make sure that you don't win that prize and I do. Right? Very different values. So, so yes, that, that thing in us, the, the thumos part that is uh, unwillingness to lose is, is a, a very important part of us. But it matters that it be rightly trained and... Um, uh, I guess, subordinated to the right values, then it becomes one of the most important things you can imagine. It's courage, which is great. But if it's not subordinated to the right values, then it just becomes brute force, bruteness, right? And, and built up. Um, so, so that's the question, like, what are you doing in your... So th- think about what happens when kids, which is where this is starting, play games. You know, competitive games, right? Do you teach them to win or do you teach them to cooperate? For example, that's one place right off the bat, a competition or cooperation. Um, and you might say, oh, they teamwork. They cooperate with their team against the other one. Well, that makes it seem like you're turning them into those guardian dogs who oppose something, whatever is not their familiar theme. That thing, that doesn't seem so nice. Um, but, the, you know, surely there are lots of ways that games can be and you know and getting physical exercise which is great like it's so much fun kids love to run they love to scream they love to play like, no doubt there are ways to get people to do that which contribute to a rich and healthy development of character that that such that in their the very activities by which they cultivate those things they are learning to engage with you know deeper values of honesty sharing whatever else or you can have those kids go to that and learn how to win at all costs. Very different, very different values. Um, and then they say the same thing about music. Like, you know, yes, again, you can you can do your training in music for the sake. Well, he he talks about the philosophic nature there, not exactly defined at this point, but you know, you can take that to mean your engagement with the highest truths. You know, and that makes sense that you would say study your study of poetry your study of music and so on study of beauty is actually orienting you to, or can be orienting you towards those sorts of things on the other hand it can be like eating cake right it can be you only want to retreat into the world of pretty things and um, uh, I guess retreat is the right word and in that case you you become as he says you know soft so th- so there's a kind of there's there's a kind of um, vice of softness related to music, that, like there's a kind of vice of savageness related to gymnastic, whereas there's a kind of virtue related to gymnastic, which would be courage. That's what it's, it's in and of itself. It's not going to give you courage, but that's what you're kind of laying the foundations for. And similarly with music, like the uh, I guess there it, it lays the foundations for something like wisdom, right? Something like that. Anyway, that's that's um. That stuff I'm talking about is basically from 410 uh, B to uh, about 412 A, and it also concludes right that you you really need both of those things. You want to you want to be bringing together the proper development of that thing that comes through music with the proper development of that thing that comes through gymnastic. It makes sense that, you know, if, uh, as I was saying, like you can you can have kids playing their games and hoping that they're, that's going to lay a foundation for good things like honesty and cooperation and sharing and whatever else. But, but probably in and of itself, playing those games isn't quite going to do that. But if at the same time, the rest of their musical education is focusing on, you know, beauty and intelligence and articulateness and whatever else comes through the study of literature and art and whatever else, you know, you can see how those things are going to fit, right? Um, so that's what they really want. They want to, he says, you, you really want to harmonize those two studies in people. And that's what's going to, that's what's going to lay that pre-cognitive, pre-theoretical foundation 
for a rich and healthy psychological life. By precognitive and pre-theoretical, what I meant by that was the stuff I was talking about last time when I was saying, you know, music and so on is sort of persuading you beneath the level of your self-conscious awareness. And gymnastic is persuading you or educating you beneath the level of your self-conscious awareness too, right? You don't play, you, kids don't play games because they think, oh, I want to lay the foundations for being courageous. They play games because it's fun, right? And similarly with music, right? But, but the point is those things have this effect below the surface. And so here we're, we're saying like, you want these two things to be working together below the surface to, to produce an environment in which a person is gonna grow up to be the kind of person who can really engage well with, with these moral matters. Um, so that's the next part of this section that I think is really quite interesting, quite quite provocative and insightful. Um, and then the last stuff I want to talk about here is um, a little bit about the guardians. Um, I wanted to, so I'll t I'm going to tell you overall what happens between here and the and where it ends at 427C in book four. I'm just going to sketch that out very quickly, and then I'm just going to highlight three or four little quotations that that seem to be important for following what's happening in the book. Um, so basically, they're now going to say, well, we have to, have to educate the guardians. And um, uh, they're going to give you some other things, too. They're, they're, uh, I think, does he start playing with Adamantus again? Maybe, I guess that's not until book four. Book four, which begins with saying, and Adamantus interrupted. You know, so book four begins then with a the conversation with him. But for the rest of book three, he's still talking with Glaucon now. And, um, and here... Uh, I think actually Glaucon came in. He had been talking with Adamantus in, in music, but I think Glaucon came in at the very end of that conversation when Socrates brought the discussion of music uh, into connection with issues of love and eros very briefly. And then Glaucon entered the conversation there by a kind of interruption. And then Glaucon was the guy who was talking with now as they went through this discussion of gymnastic. And that's going to continue to the end of book three. And then at the beginning of book four, Adamantus is going to interrupt again. Um, but what, one of the things that happens here is they talk about the guardians. There's one particular point about, the, actually two particular points about the guardians that I'm going to emphasize more focusedly in a minute. But the general thing they describe is like, what's going to, what are going to be the good living conditions here? And basically they're pretty sparse. They're, they're going to start arguing or, you know, discussing this and going to conclude like, if you really want these guys to be strong and stuff, it's better to train them. You know, they've been emphasizing simplicity, like without luxuries and so on. So you're going to want people who, um, you know, like they they can live. Um, they don't need houses. They can they they won't have private property, and they don't even need houses really. They can just live in kind of rough situations and so on. Um, and then in book four, uh, that's really going to continue, um, and they're gonna they're gonna emphasize this stuff about. Uh, you know, do they have private property? How do they deal with women? That kind of stuff like that. And you're going to, they're going to get a, a list of um, kind of the living conditions of the guardians, uh, including issues like size of the city and so on. And I think the thing that you'd have to notice there, if you hadn't noticed it already, I mean, you might've noticed it already, if you, but it, you, the thing you're really going to notice there is it sure sounds like Sparta. And you might've noticed that already in the kind of sentiment Adamantus, especially in Glaucon, to some extent, were already expressing, especially Adamantus, I think. Um, the kind, the perspective these guys are bringing to all these questions, all these issues, seem very, t seem to me and to others, uh, very much attuned to the kind of values that we would associate with what we read, the Spartan constitution, as opposed to the Athenian one. And I told you at the time when we were talking about that, that, it, you know, uh, People thought Sparta was great, and they didn't automatically think Athens was great, and even the people in Athens. And you remember you reading, well, you might not have read it, it was optional, but you remember me talking about the the anonymous uh, guy writing about Athens and saying, like, I don't like this place. Here's why it works, but I don't like it. Um, you know, I talked about how basically among the cultured, educated people who are generally pretty wealthy, oligarchic values r really held a lot of sway. Um, and so, yeah, Socrates is having this conversation in uh, Athens, for sure. But he's talking with rich kids, really, you know, high-class guys. And uh, they're, you know, they think of themselves as proper gentlemen, or they're growing up to be proper gentlemen anyway. And uh, the values they bring are, I think, generally speaking, pretty undemocratic. And the way they're describing what they'd like a city to be, what they think the guardians should be like, and so on, re resembles an awful lot that the way Sparta has been described, in, uh, you know, in fact, in the in Xenophon's constitution, um, 
and one of the things I didn't I didn't pull out the passages, but if you've been reading book three, you would notice this. One of the things that, that happens throughout here is they keep taking away stuff that they uh, were putting in. When they moved from Socrates' initial city to the Glaucon city nowadays, they added all this stuff. And now in their account, they're sort of saying, well, we should take that away. We should take that away because that's that's going to mislead them. Like this very stuff about medicine right here, like it's saying, oh, yeah, but our guardians aren't going to want to have uh, desserts and stuff like that. But basically, the the analysis that's given throughout these things kind of takes you back. The, the guardians, at least, are going to live in something more like that, what 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 um, Glaucon called the city of sows, rather than the um, luxurious city. And that very idea that there is this guardian class that runs the city, that's that's what Sparta was. Those are who the citizens were, a warrior class that ran a city of non-citizen craftspeople. Um, and indeed, that idea that guardians might be harsh masters and you might be serving them rather than them serving you may actually describe pretty well those um, Spartan rulers. So uh, again, I'm not going to pursue that in more detail, but that's if you're thinking about this as a conversation, I think the, the more you read it, the more you can get a sense of the kinds of values that you're getting from Adamantus and Glaucon. And you know, if you did that reading about Sparta uh, that I assigned way back, or that I talked about way back, um, uh, I think I think you would see, oh yeah, these guys sound like people who think Sparta is great. Um, and so yeah, so through the remainder of book three and then through the first part of book four as the situation of the guardians is described it, it more and more becomes this thing that i mean that we would call a kind of spartan environment where where we in english slang use the word spartan to mean very sparse and austere right but 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 it's also spartan literally like they're describing the the, the world of sparta from which we get that word um so that's what's going to happen um Oh, I, I guess another feature I didn't mention, there, I talked about city size, I talked about the issue, some issues of women, I talked about some issues of property, houses, all that kind of stuff. Also, the kind of absence of a meaningful musical culture also sounds like Sparta. Um, but um, but I didn't mention another one that comes up at the beginning of book four, uh, at 421C, I think is where it's, uh, I wrote down where it comes up. Uh, they again talk about the way these guys are not going to have money, they're not going to care about money. And you might remember that was a big theme in um, Xenophon's account of the Spartans. Um, okay, I just want to name so that that's a, that's a, a, a an account of what's going to happen for the remainder of this conversation with Glaucon in Book Three, and then throughout the the end of this constitution about or this this discussion of setting up the education um, that happens in the beginning of Book Four when he's talking now with Adamantus. Um, so now I just want to go through and just highlight a, a few passages that are that are quite important, um, and and add that there's a lot of things I've left out that are pretty interesting and important. Um, but so, okay, here's a few of them. Um, uh, so at the end of 395b, Socrates said, um, if then we are to preserve the first argument, which came up in book two, that our guardians must give up all other crafts. Remember that was the, the point was, you know, um, you can't have people trying to do different things. These guys are going to have to focus on their own thing, right? So they're going to give up, they're not going to, there's going to be the farmer, but the guardian is going to be a distinct craft, right? That our guardians must give up all of our crafts and very precisely be, and then he tells you what their craft is, and very precisely be craftsmen of the city's freedom. They didn't say that in book two, but it's a nice thing to say. But there they've said what it is that actually would define a guardian. You're supposed to be guarding the freedom of the city. Um pretty important. And then skip ahead here now to 412c. Um, Socrates says, uh, mustn't they, to begin with, be prudent in such matters as well as powerful, and moreover, mustn't they care for the city? That's going to be the thing that would have to define such a person. And then the next one, and a man, this is like the next thing Socrates says, a man would care most for that which he happened to love. So these, the, um, 
you're hearing something pretty important about what it actually would really take to be a guardian as as Socrates is understanding it. You have to be guarding the freedom of the city. And that means you have to care about it. Indeed, you have to love it. Just by themselves, those are very different personality traits, traits of soul, than saying you have to be a good soldier. They may or may not be compatible. I'm not, I'm not making a claim about that. I'm just saying they're very different things. And then I would say, well, they may be compatible or they may not. Right? So, so it's bo I both want you to notice that they're different and then also notice the importance of the question. Like, can those two be together? Because you remember in book book two, um, that was the initial the initial argument. Like, wouldn't the isn't a good guardian a contradiction in terms? Like they, they did it for a different reason there, but that theme has been put in our head, and you have to ask it here too. Is is training to be a warrior? How how does that relate to being loving and caring for the preservation of freedom? They might be compatible. Are they? And if so, how? And, and just analogously to the way that he said, good body doesn't make good soul, but good soul makes good body. Um, it's not the case that what you want is good warriors first and you hope that out of that you're going to develop people who care for the city. Like what the thing that really matters about the guardians is that they actually are people who are caring for the city and protecting the freedom, right? So that's, that, this value that's coming out later really has to be the defining one. And so now let's just look back half a page and we'll see an important thing that happens here. I already told you about this, but but... Now we're going to see it in, in action. He says, so we've been saying, we've been going through this whole thing saying, well, this is how the guardians are going to have to be educated, right? And then he, Socrates says, well, won't we also need some such man as an, so they say, and, and, and if they get this education, that person's going to be a, a well-developed guardian with a well-balanced gymnastic education and musical education. They're going to have a wise, moderate, courageous soul and all the rest, right? That's what you want. And he says, but, but won't we need a person like that as overseer in the city glaucon if if the regime is going to be saved right doesn't don't you have to have a person like that who is in the position of making the wise decisions about how the city is going to be run how, where this educational program is going to come from and whatever else and those would be the people then who would really have to care for the city and etc cetera, etc cetera. and so he says We'll have to select from the other guardians the, the the ones who are best, most likely going to do this. So, you know, you're getting a sort of kind of how they're they're going to be drawn out. This is not the most important thing for my purposes. Uh, the most important thing is this. Uh, at 414, right where B is in the margin, isn't it then truly most correct to call these men, those well-developed ones who are going to be the overseers and all the rest and are wise and all the rest, isn't it then truly most correct to call these men complete guardians? They can guard over enemies from without and friends from within. Whereas the young, whom we were calling guardians up to now, we shall now call auxiliaries and helpers of the ruler's convictions. So we uh, I already told you about this, but now this is where you're seeing it's happening. From, from, from the start, way back in book two, we introduced this notion of the guardians, but it was initially just introduced as warriors. But through our discussion of what we really need those people to be, we've now come to the point where we see that role that was defined right back there really needs to be the role of, you know, government or ruler, the, the wise overseer, overseer, whoever, whatever kind of thing is overseeing. And there needs to be an overseeing agency that is responsible for basically good governance. That, that is now, that's what complete guardians are. So, so we're being told that's really the true meaning of this thing we initially introduced by talking about the need for an army. And in relationship to that, we see, oh yeah, that's, so the army isn't that. The army is really just something to be the auxiliaries and helpers of that. So the reality of guardians, the, the reality of the role of guardian that was introduced in book two as if it were soldiers, the reality of that role is that it's government. And we're recognizing government needs, you know, armed forces, you know, it needs an auxiliary force to carry things out. But, but the guardians are the rulers, and the soldiers, they're the auxiliaries, the helpers, right? Anyway, th so there you get the distinction between 
there, there we get the distinction between the guardians and the auxiliaries. And then the problem of the guardians that was introduced in book two is just, is just reiterated here at 4.16a. He says, uh, mustn't we in every way guard against the auxiliaries doing anything like that to the citizens? He's talking about... Um, uh, Actually, let, let's read back a little bit. He says, Surely the most terrible and shameful thing of all is for shepherds to rear dogs as auxiliaries in such a way that due to licentiousness, hunger, or something else, they harm the sheep. Right? So a shepherd, which is like the ruler, has a dog, which is like the auxiliary soldier, to take care of the sheep. But if shepherds raise dogs in such a way that periodically they would just go and eat the sheep, that would be bad. Well, he says, Mustn't we in every way guard against the auxiliaries doing anything like that to the citizens? since they are stronger than they are, stronger than those citizens are, and then they would become like savage ma masters instead of well-meaning allies. So that's, that is that problem of the guardians that was introduced back in book two. Um, and now we can actually see, maybe we should really call it the problem of the auxiliary. Although there might be a comparable problem to the, with the rulers too, because as you remember Thrasymachus saying back in book one, well, isn't, isn't justice just the advantage of the stronger? Isn't it just, you know, aren't rulers people who just take advantage of those they rule for themselves. So like, basically, whether we're talking about the auxiliaries or the guardians, properly speaking, we have this problem of, to use the language I was using with medicine and um, courts of perversion, right? Um, uh, anyway, so, so I want to point to those two things. And then I, I have one more uh, little remark I want to make, and then I'll stop. And that's just at the beginning. Uh, so b beginning of book four, Adamantus comes up again. And just to underline that point I just made, Adamantus, it says, and Adamantus interrupted and said, um, how would you defend against this, Socrates, if someone were to say that you're not making these men happy, the guardians? And further, it's their own fault. They to whom the city in truth belongs. But you're not giving them anything good. So, so you know, Ad Adamantus... I don't know whether he's speaking just, you know, sort of devil's advocate sort of thing, speaking in the way he thinks others speak, or if he's saying what he actually thinks. But the way he says, they to whom the city and truth belong, belongs, kind of makes it sound like that's his position. But anyway, but he's saying, aren't those guardians, aren't those soldiers or whoever they are, aren't they the ones who whose city this is? And that shouldn't be the case. These people should be the city's government, the city's soldiers. But it's looking like, no, this is those people's city. So then Socrates' point is, no, that's that's the wrong way to think of it, to think of it as they are the ones to whom in truth the city belongs. Um, but that's part of, again, why I say that Adam, Adamantus either has or at least gives voice to a kind of a Spartan sensibility. Right? Um, and Socrates actually makes a pretty important point there that I'll just mention, and that's in the, the 420b down to through 421a and so on. Uh, that nec the next, um, <coughs> basically the next page, he really says, you really have to think of the city as a whole, and these people need to be functioning parts of an integrated system. It's part of that whole point he was making before, the division of labor, right? The city comes together out of the fact that people are not self-sufficient and different people take the role of carrying out different essential functions of the city. And that's what should be happening. And so the guardians are playing a role. So the city isn't about making those people rich and happy. The city the city should be about making a good life for all of those people where, where each group does the thing it's supposed to do and collectively they bring about a good life. Um, it's not what typically happens. In fact, uh, um, some groups tend to... to you know, get happy and rich at the expense of others. But but anyway, but, the, but Socrates makes that point there, that the, the, you're misconstruing the very nature of what a city should be if you think it's for the sake of a certain powerful group to exploit the others. Uh, and there again, actually, at 421a, he refers to the guardians of the law and the city as, again, another way of saying what it is they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's all I want to get to um, here. Uh, I guess I want to just read you the conclusion of this, which as I said at 427C. So remember they've been, they started setting this thing up. Um, first Socrates talked about his city and then Glaucon interrupted and talked about the city nowadays and then Adamantus kind of interrupted and they started prescribing the educational system and that so it began at the end of book two, took us through book three and now it's gone into book four and it ends at book four at 427C uh, and, and when Socrates, said, right before D when Socrates says, so then son of Ariston, I said, your city has now been founded. Right? We got it. Um, 
And uh, um, I'll just notice one one last thing about that. And it's like in one paragraph before that, they haven't, you know, they spent pages and pages talking about, you know, meter and of poems and all this kind of stuff. One paragraph before that, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, right. And also, uh, there remains the f- greatest, fairest, and first of the laws. Sounds like a pretty big deal. Uh, we're going to have to figure out, like, all the stuff we're going to do about the gods and the temples and all that sort of stuff. Okay, city's done. Let's move on. Like, it's, quite a, it's quite a thing to drop at the end that, um, oh, yeah, there's the issue of religion. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, and that's going to be the most important. And, yeah, there will be some things to say about that. And then they just zoom on and leave it. Um, and some pretty powerful things are said there that are just completely unexplored and so on. And, and you know, Socrates says those things. So it's kind of like Socrates saying, maybe maybe there were some other things that we should have addressed. But anyway, your city is now founded, and then they move on. Uh, so I'll draw your attention to that as a thing Socrates drops off there as something else that you might think, oh, it would need to be considered somewhat differently. And you might even associate this this remark at the end with the question I raised when, when Adamantus earlier said, you know, or agreed to the idea that, yeah, these stories don't resemble the gods at all. And I said, like, how would you know that? Right? So you might put those two remarks together. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. With, so that's that's a, a you know a quick run-through of the things they say about the education of the guardians. So I want to go, go on now, next time, to look at the other things that come up in book four where we're actually going to talk more directly about the soul and what the what the character of our of our who is